The unipolar madmen leading us to hell. Coming up on this week's Citizens Report. Welcome to the Citizens Report. It's the 4th of March. I'm Robert Barwick, and I'm joined today by Citizens Party organiser, Glenn Isherwood. Welcome, Glenn. Thanks, Roy. And Glenn, in today's show, we're going to be talking, giving an update on what caused the Ukraine-Russia war, right, which you will not get from the, the, uh, the media coverage in this country. Mm -hmm. And uh, we're also going to be talking about some real infrastructure that can build Australia on the scale we need. Mm -hmm. um, before we begin, just remember to like this show, uh, share it, click the subscribe button and ring the bell icon so you can be notified of updates. This is how we get the message out far and wide. Mm -hmm. um, and, and for those who missed it last night, Robbie, we did another uh, Q&A session with the Citizens Party candidates. Yes. Uh, that is available. Uh, for those who don't know, there will be an election before or on the 21st of May. It, there has to be, uh, and we're uh, building for that as well. So check that out. That came out yesterday, and we have... Uh, and there's a fair few questions we cover in there that people yeah. might find. You know, if you, if you want, ever want you know, answers to those questions, that's a forum to look at. It. We'll do more of those as mm -hmm. well. Mm -hmm. um, now, bef also before we begin, Glenn, just a couple of announcements. Uh, we put out a call last week at the end of the show. We want to do it at the beginning of the show this time. Um, our campaign, which we discussed last night for a postal bank, really intersects this epidemic, if I can use that term, of bank branch closures across Australia, which is getting more and more extreme. The banks are just shutting branches like crazy. And every time they do, especially in regional towns where it's the last bank standing, I mean, the, the town is stuffed after that. Um, the problem is the bank regulator, APRA, is supposed to record the, ac the accurate numbers of bank branches around Australia, and they don't. So there's, a, there's an excellent independent journalist uh, here in Victoria, Dale Webster, who's started a, a new online news service called The Regional. And Dale's first project, which is she, she's got a, a Walkley a grant for, is to get an accurate picture of the, um, the, uh, the closure of bank branches. And she's done a huge amount of work. But some really brilliant maps. You can zoom in on areas and you can see which towns have lost one bank, two banks, all banks, which, uh, where there is a... Uh, but the every, nearest... every mark on that map, the, the, when you zoom in on it, is very difficult for her to confirm. So we're going to crowdsource this. If you're watching this and spread the word to everyone you know, if you know of bank branches that have shut in your area and when, that's crucial, right, when they shut, Send in messages to the Citizens Party and we will forward them on to uh, Dale Webster so she can compile this information. We're going to rub this in the government's face because they, they just stand by while the banks, um, you know, just purely out of greed because they want to maximise their profits, just abandon their customers all around Australia. Now, we, and of course, we have a solution to it. Establish a postal bank, put the fear of God into the banks. They'll be scared to stop abandoning Rio Regional Australia then because they'll know that they'll lose all their customers to the postal bank. Um, but whatever they do, the Postal Bank will guarantee banking services in those regions, and that's very important. And there is a petition that everyone can sign, if you haven't already, to support that uh, Postal Bank call. Yeah. Uh, we know that this is something that multiple parties support, um, or multi people, people in, in all the parties yeah. support, but when you start to climb the ladder up to that top of the pyramid structure of the parties, the banks have that undue influence on the 100%. leadership, especially Scott Morrison. Uh, they shut it down. Look what and they that did to Christine Holgate, for example. Exactly. Uh, they uh, anyone who threatens the hegemony, the cartel, gets kneecapped um, by their political hitmen in Parliament. And we represent the leadership in recruiting an army to take on those that mafia. And so the other thing I wanted to say is that we're going to put a link below this video that people can mm -hmm. look at and go to the 2GB page. Sydney Radio 2GB, where they have an article about Christine Holgate, and they actually have a video there you can watch, which was her speech last week to the CEO Magazine Awards, and it was incredible. Um, Christine Holgate has, is showing she's not going to be a victim of this prime. She described herself as roadkill for the Prime Minister. 
mm. but she's not going to be a victim. And she actually tells the story in this speech of the banking issue that is what ultimately incurred the wrath of the Prime Minister on her. She tells the story about the effort she put in with Australia Post to save banking services in regional Australia. It's an excellent speech. You can, If you're interested in watching it, click on the link below. All right, let's get on to the uh, main subject, Glenn. The unipolar madmen leading us to hell. Um, and, of course, we're talking about what's the... the uh, we're going to be talking about the, the dynamic that's led to this terrible situation um, in Ukraine at the moment. Just an update, though. Something, you know, you, there's so much propaganda in the news. We're going to give you certain facts just because we're focusing on these facts because these are the important things anyway. Um, this is the main game. Um, so in the last week since this has been happening, Russia has put its nuclear deterrent onto high alert. And it did that for, in its view, very good reasons. There was all this rhetoric coming from the other side. Um, and it's to underscore what a big deal that is, in, on September 11, 2001, when George Bush stopped reading his book to the school kids, and he took to Air Force One and got in the plane because he's the president of America and you know, they didn't know how big the attack was, and he gets in Air Force One, the most important call he took was from Vladimir Putin. September 11, 2001, and Vladimir Putin says, we are stopping, we see what's happening to you, we are stopping all military exercises and we're taking our nuclear alert down to the lowest level so that you will not see anything from us that you can be worried about, right? Mm. It was an ultimate act of good faith, and George Bush later expressed he appreciated it. Now, four months later, Dick Cheney spat at Russia in the eye because he went and scrapped, rammed through the Congress the scrapping of the Anti-Ballistic Missile Defence Treaty, which made the world much more dangerous in nuclear mm. terms, right? Um, that was America's response to Russia's act of good faith when America needed it. Robbie, that action in 2001 by Dick Cheney is why all this is happening. There it is. is. And... When you look at the media, the coverage in all the media, what they're trying to do is narrowly isolate this to a couple of weeks, a couple of months. Oh, what what is going through insane Vladimir Putin's head? You know, this guy's lost the plot. He's unhinged. What they're denying is the historical context of this has been building for decades, and we'll go through that. But that moment in 2001 when the strategic balance which existed since the end of the Cold War, through the Cold War, of anti-ballistic missile systems, where they were located, first and second strike capabilities with the, 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 the nuclear forces of Russia and America, they were in that balance and then the US were the first to withdraw yeah. under Cheney. And from the very beginning, the Russians the most said, consequential thing, we yeah. want this treaty back, we want to sit down at the table, we don't like this action. And, and from there, there's been a, a huge amount of um, And essentially, the American, the American side's attitude and messages, well, trust us, we're not going we to bomb you with nuclear mm -hmm. weapons. Mm -hmm. Except the problem for the Russians is, the American side is the only ones that's ever used nuclear weapons. Right? Mm -hmm. Trust doesn't come into it. And um, you're right, that's, that is this, probably the single most consequential thing. There's been a whole bunch of other things after that. So when Russia today, it's or this week... It's also, Robbie, one more thing. It's not a hypothetical for Russia. The military in Russia looked at what the implications of moving these missile defence systems into Poland and Romania, and they show conclusively that this would um, create an unfair advantage for Western countries in a nuclear exchange... They show the, you know, yeah, yeah. The, we did a feature story of this in our 2012 New Citizen newspaper, warning about World War Three because of this. Uh, the Russians have shown conclusively, yes, this adds um, a great threat to Russia as a nation. It's not a, they, the West said it's all about deterring Iran's nuclear missile yeah, yeah, long range yeah. capability. That was debunked, yet... This is all the stuff that you don't hear in the media. This, this is kept out, whitewashed. And there is no equivalent of these kinds of weapons in the Western Hemisphere mm. surrounding the United States. Mm. They're right on Russia's borders. So this week, when Putin raised his nuclear deterrent alarm to the highest level, um, that was his ultimate saying, I, don't, I, don't, I do not trust you guys. You've mm. For 30 years, you've destroyed trust. You back off. This is, we are deadly serious about this, you back off. And that's where what I'm about to report next is so important because as we, we can sit here for the next week straight 
criticising the Biden administration mm. and every US government for the last 40 years. But the United, in this regard, the United States has not reciprocated, mm. right? Biden, um, by that action alone, there's something going on in, the white, in Biden and the white, in head and the other people in the White House saying, all right, we've got to be a little bit measured here, right? So that's very important. They, they haven't reciprocated. The other thing they haven't done is declare a no-fly zone. Now, they are being pushed. There is, a, there is a campaign across the United Kingdom and across the United States. Declare a no-fly zone. Robbie, maybe it's important to explain what a, a no-fly zone is to Well, I'll audience. call it a recipe for war. You Basically, explain why. That, uh, well, no, a no-fly zone, this came up around the Syria conflict as well. It's where the Western nations and the United States would shoot down any Russian plane over, U over Ukraine. The same issue came up when... Uh, Clinton and Obama wanted to declare a no-fly zone over Syria, which would have shut down any Russian, shot down any Russian planes over Syria. Russia is an ally of Syria, yeah. and it was the Joint Chiefs of Staff in the United States, led by Martin Dempsey, who talked the Congress and the presidency down from that action, because that would have been Americans shooting at Russian planes. Now they haven't done it, and then that yet, is World War Three. That's what that yeah, means. That means it's effectively a war between the United States and Russia. So far, it hasn't come to that. It's mostly proxy at the moment. And the other example of a no-fly zone, though, of what one that was instituted, is Libya. Mm -hmm. And in 2011, Barack Obama said to the Russians, we're going to put in a no-fly zone in Libya. And Vladimir Putin wasn't the president then. He was the prime minister. That was, his, that was his five years as prime minister. Sergei Medvedev was the president. And he accepted... Medvedev accepted Obama's pledge that establishing the no-fly zone over Libya would not lead to regime change. They, so Russia did not veto it in the UN Security Council on the basis of that pledge. And of course it was a lie. It immediately did lead to regime change. They took one of the most advanced countries in Africa and absolutely destroyed it. In 2016, the United Kingdom House of Commons produced a report saying, yep, yeah, we were wrong about that one too, people. Oops! Right, put that report on the shelf. Um, but ever since then, Russia has never accepted America at its word. Specifically, Robbie, that report from the, from the British Parliament said we didn't have evidence of a um, humanitarian crisis. We didn't have evidence of crimes against humanity being committed by Gaddafi. It, was, it wasn't... It was Hype. It was hype. Basically, everything that justified our intervention, and we, ignored we the didn't have evidence for. And we ignored like the, the fact... the WMDs in Iraq. And we did ignore the fact that the people who were enemies of Gaddafi were absolute head-chopping, bloodthirsty terrorists. We just ignored that at the time. Now we acknowledge they were. Not to go on a tangent, but <laughs> those very same interests, like the um, the Algerian Islamic Fighting Group, were given sanct uh, sanctuary in uh, the UK, yep. including the terrorist who did the Manchester terrorist bombings yep. over the Ariana Grande concert. So, if you're a Russian and you know all this, you know <laughs> you, you see why they just have zero respect uh, for the West. However, that's so just to underscore, we've, we've, we've shown how dangerous a no-fly zone is. Uh, Biden is not doing one. Very, very important. He's not the dumbest guy in the world. <laughs> we probably get some feedback on that, <laughs> but he's not. Okay. Um, finally, the other bit of news, very important, is Ukraine and Russia are in negotiation. This is, in, this is the main game, right? And then today, breaking news is they have agreed to limited ceasefires so they can establish humanitarian corridors so that people can leave some of these conflict zones safely. Russia is not going to back off what it's doing, but um, they are in negotiation. That's where this, this, um, uh, this, this, this uh, conflict will be concluded or not. All right, so that's very important. But let's now talk about the context and what's happening. First of all, there's been so much propaganda. I mean, I personally, you don't go through... Glenn's slightly younger than me, but I was, what was I, I was still in my 20s, I think. Yeah, I was 29 <laughs> when, um, uh, uh, when we invaded Iraq, mm -hmm. right? And you just we, remember, you know, the fight to stop it was huge. You had something like 30 million people in countries all around the world protest that war. And did it stop? Did it stop it? No. They were determined for it to happen. Um, and we killed a million people. We destroyed a country and we, on, a, on the basis where we said our security depends on us doing it. Well, Russia's now saying its security depends on its operation in Ukraine. And it's done nothing compared to what we did in Iraq. 
But where is the where is the um, the proportionate reporting in the media of what of of what our actions are compared to what uh, um, Russia's are? One of the claims, which is just so ridiculous, it's not funny. We're going to play a video on this now. That and it's it's actually not just ridiculous, uh, Glenn. It's a lie. It's also racist. So the claim is this is this is shocking. This is the first attack on a European capital since World War II. They emphasise European capital because, and you can see them online. There's a whole host of commentators who just let it slip. Oh, this isn't supposed to happen to us white people. This is this, they actually say this. This is supposed to happen in Afghanistan or Iraq or or some of those or third world those countries. Uncivilized. Those places. uncivilized places, right? No, you got away with it for so long. Now it's coming back to bite you. But the one about this is the first attack on a European capital since World War II because that that feeds the, the narrative that Putin is acting like Hitler. No, it is not. So watch Scott Ritter. And Scott Ritter, for all those lefty liberals out there who are now Putin haters, but who are old enough to have joined the marches against the, the Iraq war, you will remember back then Scott Ritter was a goddamn hero. We all went, he came to Australia and toured it because he was an American weapons inspector in Iraq, and he was said, look, there are no weapons here, and he fought very hard to stop that war, and we all thought he was a hero. Well, now listen to what he's saying that contradicts the propaganda in your head right now. Roll the tape. Vladimir Putin, when he spoke to the Munich Security Council uh, Conference back in uh, 2007, when he challenged the unitary uh, world order uh, that led by the United States in a single polar world, and he said, no, that day is gone. That ship has sailed. There is a new world order and a need for a new European security order that uh, goes beyond the NATO concept. Um, and, and, and Putin put the marker on the table. He said, that what you're doing here is wrong. You know, people keep saying, uh, Russia's the aggressor. They had no choice. What do you call a, an ostensibly defensive military alliance, which lies about its intentions to expand in a post-Cold War era, and then goes on the offensive, bombing a European capital, Belgrade. I mean, everybody's sitting there going, oh, Kiev is being bombed first time in Europe. No, NATO bombed Belgrade without any authority from the Security Council in violation of international law, doing the exact same thing that they accused, they're accusing Russia of doing now. Uh, NATO said, oh, you can't create these independent states of Lugansk and, Do and, and, and Donetsk. Um, well, yes, you can, because you guys created the independent state of Kosovo, carved it right out of Serbia, again, with no founding in international law, nothing. Um, and then NATO went on to basically legitimize the illegal invasion and occupation of Iraq, even though NATO as an organization didn't participate, several NATO members did. And in 2004, a few months after the occupation, NATO legitimized the occupation by creating the NATO training mission in Iraq. NATO went into Afghanistan. How does a North Atlantic treaty organization end up in Afghanistan? Uh, NATO bombed Libya for the sole purpose of achieving regime change. And so now Russia's looking at this saying, uh, we're not happy with this offensive military organization, which is expanding to our borders. And every time they absorb a member, what happens? They automatically get covered by the shroud of Article 5, which means that if Russia uh, took action against one nation who might overstep their boundary, let's say a Baltic state who has a grudge to bear, or Poland, who you know definitely has a burr in their saddle about Russia, all of NATO is supposed to come in. That is a threat. That is an existential threat to Russia. And so, you know, when Stoltenberg says a, a new, you know, European security order is, is, is being promulgated by Russia, he's right. Russia's fed up with this. That's why Russia said, y'all got to go back to 1997 borders before you started expanding. Uh, that doesn't mean that you dismantle NATO. Russia's not calling for the dismantlement of NATO. What they're saying, though, is all those British troops, French troops, American troops, uh, that are currently deployed in Poland into the Baltic states, got to go home, get away from our borders. Um, and Russia, I, what, I think what this Ukraine situation, again, let me just start by saying this is a tragedy. Anytime there's a war, it's a human tragedy. I'm not sitting here cheering for war. It's literally the worst possible option. But they, they teach you in martial arts that when you, uh, 
and you get in a fight with someone and you back them into a corner, um, they're going to kick your butt because they got nothing to lose. Russia literally was backed into a corner. And so Russia is responding the only way they can. And people are only talking today about Ukraine. You know, this is about Ukraine. This is about Russia denying Ukraine NATO member. No, this is about a new order in Europe. NATO refuses to engage Russia on uh, the, the, the topic of returning in 1997 orders and all this. They say it's unthinkable to even engage that way. Well, Russia's changing the geopolitical reality. So there you go, Glenn. Belgrade, 1999. Right, a European capital, we bombed the ever loving crap out of it. We even bombed the Chinese embassy with smart bombs. Oops, oh, we didn't mean that. Well, I can tell you now, no one in China believes NATO didn't mean that. Mm. Right, mm. it was it was an annihilation. We used to have we had a street, so we had signs in our campaign against it on the street. We had a, the best one was more Plato, less NATO. This was our 1999 street sign. We do we, remember that, yeah. Um, uh, but you see that the other thing that Rita's talking about is, is the driving f uh, factor here is America's or the Anglo-American determination to remain the sole superpower. And mm. the problem is they, dis they had laid out, we'll talk about that more in a minute, but they laid out that determination at a time when they were the sole superpower. And since then, the, the rise of China and Russia regaining its strength has changed the dynamic and they do not want to accept that. But back on the hypocrisy. So you're getting a lot of media reporting. Just, I, I mean, on Scott Ritter. I mean, this is a, an American. An American. Uh, and there are, and we'll go through the list of diplomats in a, 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 and, and yep. ex experienced, uh, you know, high degree uh, experts. Experts. Not that we like all of them, like Henry Kissinger's in that list, for example. But the fact is, you know, we uh, this this discussion can sometimes get. get uh, reduced down to, oh, it's uh, you backing Russia against yeah, America. Yeah. No, there is a spirit and a, and, a, and a soul of the United States, which is not what we're seeing here. And, you know, the, there are patriots, there are veterans of intelligence in the United States who have been trying to stop this type of, you know, uh, Cold War mentality. I mean, Ray McGovern, yeah. the veterans intelligence for... Professionals for sanity. Veteran intelligence professionals for sanity. There's a lot of these groups uh, and veterans of intelligence and diplomacy all saying yeah. it's our fault this happened um, yeah. because we kept poking the bear, poking the bear, poking the bear, and then once it, one, once it actually lashed out uh, to defend its, na the nation, its nation, we're suddenly shocked and surprised. And, we and shouldn't be, be. And because it's our fault it's happened, it's one of the reasons you have to see propaganda like this. That's all they've got is propaganda. So I've just got to give you another example. So what you're seeing in the new, everyone's noticing in the media reporting, mm -hmm. you're being told civilians are being killed and it's so hard. You, you see these footage of people and, you know, the Zelensky's bravely fighting and leading his, and the, Russia, the, the Russians have, in, have encountered this resistance they didn't expect and Vladimir Putin's miscalculated and it's so horrific. Here's the new Hitler, blah, blah, blah. Um, and all I can point out, all we can point out is just contrast the reporting now with when it's our side launching the bomb. So this was a rather notorious bit of footage we're about to play here. This was um, America's uh, Brian Williams on MSNBC in 2017 when Trump uh, bombed Syria the first time. And there's, there, are, there are civilians on the receiving end of this bomb as well. But look at how he describes it go into greater detail we see these beautiful pictures at night from the decks of these two u.s navy vessels in the eastern mediterranean i am tempted to quote the great leonard cohen i'm guided by the beauty of our weapons um, and they are beautiful pictures of uh, of fearsome armaments making what is for them a brief flight over to this airfield yeah <laughs> I mean, that's pretty sick, Robbie. It is uh, sick. Absolutely. Right? But, and, and it, look, and people did notice at the time and say, look, well, what, what's going on? But that's part of the mass psychosis that he represented of the, the way the media signs up for this, right? And they do. And our media has absolutely signed up for this as well. Um, and then last night, we won't play the footage, but today's Friday, Thursday night, mm -hmm. Q&A. Um, one Russian Australian was in the audience and he expressed support for what Putin was doing. He didn't express support for violence. 
He just expressed support for what Putin was doing in Putin's own terms. And that sanctimonious jerk, Stan Grant, who is um, a, a close associate of this US-funded war tank called ASPE, Australian Strategic Policy Institute, ordered him um, uh, out of the audience. I don't think I've ever seen anything like that before. He ordered him out of the audience because how dare you come in and he claimed he was supporting violence. No, he wasn't. He was well, just trying to express another side. Robbie, I, I think, uh, yeah, if, if the conjecture is that Putin is um, a <clears throat> censors, you know, people's views and shuts down debate, uh, it doesn't <laughs> look too good when this happens in Australia. Uh, what that, well, we've banned, that, uh, we've banned RT now. Yeah, well, what that fella... Um, uh, raised in Q and A was the Azov Battalion. Um, yep. This is uh, they have been uh, backed and funded and equipped by the Ukrainian National Guard since the coup that happened in 2014. They were part of an instrumental in overthrowing the uh, government in 2014. They then straight away became the fighting forces in the Lugansk and. Uh, uh, Donbass regions uh, in the far eastern part of Ukraine where these people said we're not having this government we don't recognize it as legitimate and they've had a civil war since 2014 that as of battalion there were articles running in ABC um, and in Western media showing that these guys are ne openly neo-nazis Nazi symbology uh, viciously anti-russian yep. they and they led in the government since 2014, banning the Russian language from being used in schools. I mean, bear in mind this is a language native to, I think it's around 60% of the Ukrainian population. And this ferocious anti-Russian sentiment that swept the country, uh, you know, it got to a point where the NATO expansion, um, the de facto arming of Ukraine with, through NATO that was happening even though it wasn't a member, but there were training drills running year-round. And Russia basically said, it's just a matter of time that Ukraine will join NATO. Yep. So we're acting in our national interest and defence now. The war is terrible, but the thing is, uh, when you um, don't, if you ignore all the warning signs for decades and decades, this is what happens. No, for sure. Um, and so he, that was what he was mm. expressing. Mm. By the way, Stan Grant would have known that's what he was expressing, mm. right? Because, you know, he know he, someone like Stan Grant would know about the Azov Battalion. Um, but, of course, that narrative, not, you're not allowed to admit that, there's not, that there really are neo-Nazis in um, uh, Ukraine. So what have we seen? We've seen? The other thing we've seen that's so different to when, when we have led these invasions like Iraq, Russia has been kicked out of the world economy effectively, sports, cultural events, mm -hmm. some, some stupid European... Um, competition ban Russian cats. <laughs> um, you know, where was this punishment for us? Did we did we did we receive any punishment, any sanction for what we did? We know, everyone knows we did it on a lie, and a million people are dead, our country destroyed. Did we receive any sanction for what we did? Where was we? We even gave it a name, Glenn. We called our bombing campaign of Baghdad shock and awe. We gave it a Hollywood title, right? Um, we, we, we gave Afghanistan a name, Operation Enduring Freedom. Have we, has there been any punishment for Obama, Barack Obama's reign of terror from the sky through drone strikes? All in, all in breach of the sovereignty of the countries that he was bombing, right? The, the kids in Pakistan, countries like Pakistan and Yemen, learned to be terrified of clear days because a clear day meant that a drone way up in the sky that they could never see or hear could bomb the crap out of them, mm. right? Cloudy days was when they were able to run, roam around and play freely, right? That's what they learned under Barack Obama. Any, any blowback from that? Hillary Clinton, she cackled in 2011 when informed that Gaddafi had been killed. And how was he killed? The, some of the worst terrorists in the world were tipped off by Hillary to where he was going to be. He was captured and he was anally raped with a bayonet. That's how he was killed, by these... Absolute monsters. And she then said... The guns from that conflict ended up being funneled into Syria, Syria and equipping um, Islamic State. And when, she, when Hillary was informed, she said, she cackled, uh, we came, we saw, he died. But that action turned Libya into a failed state 
a haven for terrorism and a place where, for the first time in who knows how long, slave trading returned to Africa, mm. right? Thanks to that intervention, and like we already talked about, the UK House of Commons admitting here was all based on rubbish. They and don't even, not, not to only mention are... terrorism exploded across Africa in conjunction with that and um, the... Well, the uh, yeah. and, and the refugees into Europe from yeah. it yeah. who get hit back and now the white ones coming over the border yeah. from Ukraine, they're welcome. But not only, not only was there no punishment for those things, did the leaders responsible ever express regret? You would have someone like Colin Powell express regret for his role in the lie of weapons of mass destruction, but he was the only one. The rest, to this day, stand by what they did. We justify what they did, right? And yet we're supposed to think that um, what Vladimir Putin is doing is the, the only other worst one thing I since could, I do life. recall was Walter Jones of North Carolina. Well, in Walter's defence, he was a very decent man. He just he had a role as a congressman in voting, but he wasn't the mastermind of that. Yeah, yeah. Um, now, one other narrative that has to be taken up, though, is that the entire world is united in opposing Putin. Mm -hmm. Well, that's an, there's a few inconvenient truths to that. First of all, they did have this they did have this UN vote, UN General Assembly vote, which was 140 or something to five. Um, but among the the, the more interesting picture is the, the, the 35 or 40 countries who abstained, right, because they just weren't interested. And then a whole bunch of, bunch of countries didn't even turn up. Half, half the African countries didn't even turn up. Um, and among those countries who uh, abstained, you've got, you know, China, uh, India, big countries that are not going along with this. In fact, they, our, our government tried to hold this emergency quad meeting overnight to try and get India back in the tent. But India's not interested, right? Um, and then there's other countries that, you know, they get their arm twisted at the UN to vote against what Russia's doing. But on the other hand, they're refusing to go along with the sanctions. So Mexico is one of those. Indonesia is one of those. These are big, significant countries. Brazil. The, the world is not united on this. The, the kind of rhetoric we're getting out of the Australian government is just a whole heap of um, uh, rubbish. Um, we have dis we have we can't do total justice to it, Glenn. I do urge people to get to call in and get a copy of our um, this week's magazine here. The headline is "Sanctimonious Hypocrisy Will End in World War II. Um, Three. Sorry, yeah, World War Three. <laughs> you know, World War Two is that's been and done. Um, we highlight in there though certain uh, undeniable truths about how explicitly these evil institutions in the West have been doing exactly what Putin accused them of doing in his speech, plotting the overthrow, the breakup, and the total destruction of Russia. And, and Dick Cheney was one of those who, who um, started it back in the, the 2000s. Um, there's an interesting reference there to the RAND Corporation, and we're going to publish um, again next week what the RAND Corporation did in 2020, laying out a plan for the annihilation of Russia. We, we, we cite what's known as the Brzezinski Map, Whereas the big new Brzezinski, the architect of the Afghanistan use of, you know, let's use terrorism against the Soviets in Afghanistan, which of course blew up in the world's face. Um, in the 90s, the big new Brzezinski was waving around this map, just splitting Russia into three, right? And, you know, this, the problem with these geopoliticians in England or, or the United States, they think it's this right. They're, it's their right to redesign the world because they say, we're going to define you as a threat, etc. But the more, the more interesting thing that just cannot be denied is how many, what you referenced earlier, the, the list of experts over the years who warn, if we keep doing this, it will lead to war. So we're going to go through their names, but as we're doing it, just remember, well, if there's 30 years of warning against the expansion of NATO will lead to war, you cannot focus all your attention on the war that was predicted without putting equal blame for the lead-up to it, right? So here, here, are, here are some very prominent voices. Former Australian Prime Minister Paul Keating, landmark speech, 1997. He'd only been out of power for a year. He said, that's going to be a disaster. Two former US ambassadors, and they were very significant ones, are US ambassadors to the Soviet Union. Jack Matlock, who was the last one ever in the late 80s, and... George Kennan, who had been an ambassador in the 50s, both in the late 90s when, when NATO started to expand, warned this will end in disaster. The current CIA director, William Burns, 
who's a Biden CIA director now, in 2008, when he was the American ambassador to Russia, he said, that is a red line. That's going to end in war. Um, you cited Henry Kissinger. In 2014, he said Ukraine should never join NATO. Right? Why? Because it would be a disaster. Prime Minister Malcolm, former Prime Minister Malcolm Fraser, a friend of ours, emphatic about it. This will be a disaster. Bob Gates, the former US Defence Secretary, wrote in his book in, in 2015, this will be a disaster. We know that the Russians will not tolerate this. Well, um, I'll, I'll continue. The last name here, Sir Roderick Lyon, former UK ambassador to, to um, Russia, he, he repeated this warning as recently as, as um, 2021. So how can the, all these people warn about it and then we get here and go, oh, why is Putin doing this? Mm. These people, yeah, they, they uh, made the point. We beat the Soviet Union. They collapsed. Now the time is to f form new uh, security architectures for the world, which in are inclusive yep. to Russia, not the kick them while they're down. We're now a unipolar world. We set the rules. Um, and people need to also realize in the 90s in Russia, there was a net population decline. Yep. There was mass death from a looting policy. They took a heavily socialized economy, communist country, and they radically used neoliberal policies to switch it to a free market. A lot of billionaire oligarchs came out of it, but the actual living standards plummeted. Alcoholism went through the roof. People died. And, the, and you know, a whole bunch of people in the West may, became very rich. Filthy, Not just the oligarchs, filthy rich. filthy rich out of it. And that was the context where Putin actually um, got elected in the first place yeah. uh, and has had this you know, very, very long support um, uh, throughout these last several decades because the Russian people were reacting to something. Uh, and it was in the 90s where the promises were made in the 80s and 90s at the folding of the Soviet Union, the Western... Powers, Germany, uh, uh, the United States said, we won't expand NATO. And now the head uh, Stoltenberg and these guys said, oh, we never made such promises. We never made such guarantees. And since then, I think it's 14 countries have entered NATO, including the, the Baltic countries. So, uh, yeah, this and is one, again. I have to, we'll even run this clip. I have to use it. Um, I, wasn't gonna, I wasn't planning on doing it, but this week on Fox News in America, the, the host, Harris Faulkner, was interviewing Condoleezza Rice. Condi, remember Condi? And Condoleezza was the national security uh, advisor when um, she encouraged uh, the, the Georgia breakaway, which led to Russia's putting its foot down on that. And then, of course, the, the Estonian states joining NATO, knowing that these, were, that these were red lines for Russia. So anyway, watch what Harris Faulkner says about how bad an invasion of a country is. Look, listen clearly how she describes it and look at Condoleezza's agreement with that. And remember, this woman was the national security advisor for the invasion of Iraq. Just watch that. Well, and I have argued that when you invade a sovereign nation, that is a war crime. <laughs> I mean, I think we're at, at, at just a real basic, basic point there. Well, um, I'd, I'd agree. It is certainly against every principle of international law and international order. And that's why throwing the book at them now in terms of economic sanctions mm -hmm. and punishments is also a part of it. And I think the world is there. Uh, certainly NATO is there. He's, he's managed to unite NATO in ways that I didn't think I would ever see again after the end of the Cold War. Really? Yeah. yeah. And that's what you're dealing with, Glenn. They, mm. These people, they, they did this. And they get to sit there on television now and pretend mm. that mm. the thing that they did against all these warnings we've just gone through, mm. um, is somehow worse than uh, that, 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 or the reaction to that is somehow worse than, than um, even, even calling it a war crime. And she's nodding, saying, yeah, it is a war crime. Well, then that makes her a war criminal, right? And, and <clears throat> statements like that uh, cheapen the whole issue of national sovereignty because it's, it, it, they're saying it's, it's up to us to decide when this applies and when it doesn't. Yeah, yeah. If it's universal, it's universal. So. And people will be wondering, well, what's our, what do we advocate for in this Ukraine-Russia situation? Well, I believe with the dialogue opening, there's a few hard lines for Russia. If there's a guarantee that Ukraine is not, uh, by treaty, Ukraine will not enter NATO. Um, if there is a dismantling of these 
right wing, these these neo Nazi um, military, you know, battalions in Ukraine, and they're disbanded. Um, justice for what happened with the Odessa, you know, uh, when they burned all those people alive, and those people are brought to yep. justice. Um, then there's no there's no case for Russia to remain in and in Ukraine. They withdraw, and what happens is Ukraine finds uh, a mid, uh, a place where it's not hostile to its neighbour Russia, uh, where there's you know 600 500 years of history of uh, R Russian you know families going back through. Um, there's uh, and they're not brought into geopolitical games of the West. There is a way forward there where national sovereignty is respected and maintained, and the security for all is maintained. Um, and that's the that's the option we advocate for. Um, no, it is now. One of the things that we would we would have dearly loved to do, and we will do it in coming weeks, is there's also a way I referred to it on the on the um, the show last night. One of the problems here is the. the too, too often this is looked at like a chessboard, mm. right? What moves, you know, what, what moves keep it in balance, that sort of thing. Not only do we have to overturn the chessboard, we've got to stop playing chess, right? Now, that's a bigger deal. Um, You've you got to do that in a very careful way. And the Citizens Party have a, has a slogan, Peace Through Economic Development. Mm -hmm. We believe that um, you can redefine the way the world thinks about itself by actually, by actually putting the chance for cooperation and collaboration between nations first, but not just on a say, oh, everyone, let's all agree to peace. No, let's agree to a foundation for peace. Let's work on a, a joint commitment to economic development that can raise everyone's living standards, um, make populations feel like they're progressing, everyone participates in it, right? And that's how you, over time, um, change these dynamics which have the world primed for war, right? And we're going to talk about that a lot more in, in coming weeks because you, there was an opportunity for that at the end of uh, the Cold War and instead the unipolar madness. Unipolar meaning the Anglo-American idea that there's going to be one sole superpower, right? The unipolar madness is what was allowed to reign and now we're at this point. Um, so let's hope it's resolved. Now the other thing, Glenn, is we did plan to do a thing on uh, infrastructure related to that, but... I think we've run out of time for this show. So we will do that next week as well. Mm -hmm. um, we've got lots to say about uh, infrastructure, but this has been a, a more involved uh, discussion. So uh, let's leave it at that. Let's hope this gets resolved very soon. But I do uh, one little point, that, you know, what can you do? What can Australians do to help end this? One little thing you can do, don't believe your own government's propaganda. And if it stops working, they might stop trying it. And if you want an example of propaganda from our government, um, ScoMo, beating his chest, announced he's, we're sending 17 million worth of missiles and ammunition, ammunition um, to, to uh, Ukraine, um, uh, which, of course, amounts to just writing a cheque for the military-industrial complex. I was going to say, is that $70 million of missiles and ammunition we have... And built here, or is it just coming from this will Lockheed be here, Martin? Here, Raytheon, here, here, Lockheed Martin, have some money, right? Yeah. Um, and then he was asked, well, how are you going to get it there? And I've got to quote him, because we should all laugh at this. Like, he, 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 this guy deserves to be laughed out of town. He says, um, uh, so he's asked, how are you going to get it there? And this is what he said, quote, I don't plan to give the Russian government a heads up about what's coming their way, but I can assure them it's coming your way. Well, now, what do you think Vladimir Putin would think of that? <laughs> well, we just did mention that we're sending $70 million worth of missiles and ammunition. <laughs> so I think the Russians know what's coming there, uh, coming to them, but uh, how it when, gets when there. Putin, when Putin visited Australia in 2015, he was asked, what do you think of Australia, Mr Putin? He says, I never think of Australia. <laughs> anyway, all right, look. Um, uh, yeah, we've warned about this for a long... We discussed this last week. Um, we've touched on a little bit there... Uh, we, we're gonna, we need to make this a more constructive discussion, though. The people in charge of our countries right now aren't capable of it. The people, have to, the people, the public, have to demand, if you don't like war, work very hard with the Citizens' Party to avert war before it happens. Because once you get to the point, you, once you get to, if you're allowed to get to that red line, all bets are off, and that's where we're at now. So on that note, Glenn, thanks for joining us this week. Thank you. And thanks to the viewer for tuning in. Click on the links below we've talked about, like the Christine Holgate speech, and uh, tune in next week for more of the Citizens Report.
Authorised by Robert Bowick, Citizens Party, Melbourne.